Good morning. Um, thanks for coming today. Just uh, going to talk a little bit about the horizontal directional drilling for the raw water intakes at the Falmouth Long Pond Water Treatment Plant. For those of you who don't know, the town is currently in the middle of construction of a new 8 MGD water treatment plant uh, for the Long Pond surface water in Falmouth. Um, and they're about halfway through that construction. And this directional drilling was a small piece of the overall construction, but, but a very critical piece. Uh, just an overview of the presentation, give you a little history and background on the Long Pond surface water supply itself, go into some of the regulatory drivers which ultimately led to the decision to construct the new treatment plant, and then knowing that we were going to construct the treatment plant, we went through a site evaluation to determine the, the best location for the treatment plant, and then once we had the location for the new treatment plant, we conducted an evaluation for a, well, a raw water pump station and intake evaluation to determine if we wanted to use the existing pump station facilities to pump water to the new treatment plant or if we wanted to construct uh, a new pump station and intake altogether. Then I'll go into a little bit of the design and permitting associated with the directional drill and then just go through the actual construction. So a little history and background, the town of Falmouth population, it is a Cape Cape Town, so winter population about 33,000, summer 78,000, so you can imagine that operations for a system like this are, are difficult enough between winter and summer in terms of demands, but when you get a big fluctuation in population, it only contributes to uh, making operations even more difficult. Um, Long Pond itself, it's a 150 acre kettle hole. Um, there's no inlets or outlets to the pond, it's primarily groundwater fed. Uh, it is the town's primary water supply since the 1890s. Uh, they greater than 1 billion gallons of water per year is pumped from the existing facilities. It comes for about 60% of the town's public water supply. They do have some other groundwater sources in town, including a small pressure filtration treatment plant for iron and manganese removal. Um, and then in terms of treatment, the existing facilities, there's no filtration at the existing facilities for the surface water. They only add, they use chlorine gas for CT disinfection and hydroxide for corrosion control and then send it out to the distribution system. <clears throat> so just a quick, uh, just to quickly show the existing facilities. Um, you can see there's a light green color here. These are, there's two existing intakes that draw water from the pond low lift pump station that takes the water and at that point is when the chlorine is added and then it pumps it over to this one million gallon baffled contact tank and that's where they get their CT and then from the tank the water drains to a high lift pump station down here where the hydroxide a is added and then you can see it comes out in the dark blue lines in both directions out to the distribution system. All right, so just uh, some of the regulatory and customer-based drivers that ultimately led to the decision to construct the treatment plant. The surface water treatment rule uh, requires that all surface waters disinfect for three-log giardia and four-log virus inactivation, um, and also requires surface waters to filter their water. The town is currently not filtering their water. They operate under a filter waiver, um, and to do this, they need to meet certain filtration avoidance criteria which over the years has become more and more stringent. Um, some, of the, some of the parameters in that filtration avoidance criteria actually include some raw water items like turbidity, which they don't really have a ton of control over um, the raw water turbidity in, from the pond. So you can see that it's difficult to maintain compliance with this criteria. Um, LT2, when that was introduced, compliance was required by October 2012. The town actually got an extension to 2014. Um, however, they're still not in compliance with LT2. That introduced the requirement to meet the two log uh, crypto removal. And to do this, being an unfiltered surface water, they would have to introduce uh, additional chemical feed systems like an ozone system or UV um, or chlorine dioxide in order to, to be in compliance because LT2 required two disinfectants um, to remove the, the two log crypto. And then stage two, when that was uh, adopted, it changed the overall running annual averages for TTHMs and HAA5s to locational running annual averages. And since that was adopted, the town has struggled 
in a couple specific locations to meet this every quarter. Um, they've actually had uh, multiple violations of the TTHMs uh, over the past few years. So based on not complying with LT2 and Stage 2, the Mass DEP issued an ACO in August of 2014. At that point, we were well into the design for the new treatment plant. Um, they put a three-year compliance period in there knowing that construction was expected to start in spring of 2015, so it would be done over a two-year period to be done in spring of 2017. So that's where the three-year compliance period came in. And then finally, we have a, a customer annual taste and odor complaint. So they actually discharged the water from the, from the existing pump station at a, a fairly high chlorine residual that, along with it being an unfiltered uh, source, uh, you can imagine, results in several calls for taste and odor complaints from its customers. So that, that being said, uh, we now knew we were constructing a, a treatment plant. Uh, we had to select the best site around the pond. All the parcels around the pond are actually owned by the town, which was a good thing. Um, but right off the bat, we, we eliminated the parcels on the north and west side of the pond. Uh, this was, these primarily were moraine soils, which were poor soil conditions with varied topography and lots of boulders. So it was uh, poor conditions for constructing a new treatment plant would require the removal of a lot of material and trucking in a lot of outside materials, um, which was not ideal. It would just add to construction cost. Um, and then the poor, the poor soil conditions with poor infiltration um, would make the stormwater management basins that much bigger, again, contributing to additional construction cost. And then utility and utility access and access construction costs were looked at. The, the, primary, the primary transmission mains and the main electric infrastructure were actually located on the south and east of the pond. So if we wanted to put a plant on the north or west side, we would have long runs to connect up uh, the electrical and water transmission mains, uh, and again, adding to construction cost. So we, we moved on looking to the parcels on the south and the east side of the pond. The treatment plant, or the, sorry, the existing pump station is actually located on the south side now. Um, but these parcels on the south and east were primarily outwashed with nice sand and gravel soils and much flatter topography, uh, much more conducive to construction and stormwater management. Um, and again, the utilities that we wanted to connect up to were on the on the sides already, so we'd have shorter shorter connection points. So this just shows a picture of the pond. Like I said, we we narrowed it down to parcels on the south and the east side of the pond. We looked at uh, a number of criteria, including parcel size. The the parcel had to be big enough in order to fit the footprint of the treatment plant and lagoons and stormwater stormwater management basins that went along with the, with the new plant. We also looked at topography. We wanted to, to find some, some level land that was above elevation 35. Uh, groundwater in the area is typically seen around 10 or below. So if we could maintain an elevation above 35, we'd be about 25 feet above the groundwater. We had some deep tanks that we were designing for the plant. So this would avoid construction within the groundwater, um, which is a good thing. And then as far as access, to the pond and street frontage. We, we wanted both of those um, for the parcel access to the pond in case we wanted to construct a new intake and then access to the street because that's where all the utilities were located. Um, and then we looked at abutter impacts on, this is Gifford Street over here. And on the east side, there's uh, several condos and different things. So we, we had to be considerate about the neighbors. We didn't want to construct a plant uh, right out at Gifford Street to be a big eyesore for for the neighbors. And wetlands and permitting. So along the east side, there's several uh, different wetlands and vernal pools. So we had to consider that and potentially extensive permitting that would result uh, with the Conservation Commission if we wanted to run within buffer zones and things like that. So ultimately, we selected this parcel that's sort of highlighted in orange here. Uh, had the right parcel size, plenty of room for the new plant. Uh, and the infrastructure. Topography was good, uh, met our requirements for finding some good flat land above 35. Uh, had access to the pond and street frontage, and it was big enough where we could locate the plant into the woods further up Gifford Street to, to have a natural buffer between the street and the plant. And the only wetland, there's a little piece of the buffer zone, there's a wetland up to the north of it. Um, so there's just a little piece of the buffer zone, and that really wasn't in an area where we were going to be constructing in anyway. 
So at this point, we have the site selected, and now we have to make a decision if we're going to use the existing pump station to pump water up to the treatment plant or if we're going to construct a new intake, raw water pump station. Uh, so the existing station, we looked at some of the desi design parameters that would be involved in that. We looked at the condition of the existing intakes. Some recent inspection reports showed some minor corrosion, um, which obviously was not uh, a good thing when we were talking about constructing a brand new treatment plant. We didn't want to be relying on an old intake that uh, potentially could fail in the future. Um, this is a picture of the existing intake. You can see the buildup on it uh, in the pond. Um, to, to run from the existing facilities up to the new treatment plant it would require about 3,800 linear feet of 24 inch piping that would run along the east side of the pond. So we'd be running through several buffer zones uh, in terms of wetlands, which wasn't ideal in terms of permitting the Conservation Commission, and then mechanical and electrical upgrades. Uh, if we wanted to use the existing station, we'd have to replace pumps, we'd have to uh, replace motors, and uh, in order to provide the right flows and heads in order to get the water up to the new treatment plant. And then there were electrical voltage concerns. The existing facilities continue to have voltage fluctuations to the point where they burned out motors uh, over the years. and. If we're, again, if we were going to be constructing a new facility, we didn't want to have these same type of problems. Um, and then finally, the logistics of startup and temporary facilities. Uh, if we were going to use the existing facilities to pump up to the new treatment plant, it would be a little difficult because we'd have to draw water from the pond and treat that and then send it out to the distribution system. But at the same time, we'd have to be drawing water from those intakes and pumping up to the new treatment plant in order to test the new plant. So that would require some temporary pumping systems and uh, it would be difficult during startup. And finally, we looked at cost. Second alternative was a new intake and pump station. Some of the design parameters we were looking at there, we'd, we'd construct a, a two-level intake system with 36-inch screens. This is a picture of the, the style of screen that we'd be using. Um, 300 linear feet, there'd be 300 linear feet between these screens in the pond and the raw water pump station that would be back on the shore. And then from the pump station to the treatment plant would be another 1,200 feet or so of 24-inch uh, piping, raw water piping. Uh, within the pump station itself, we'd have an airburst cleaning system to periodically clean the screens. Uh, we'd obviously need the new raw water pump station itself. We'd have to run power out to the new pump station, and uh, we'd have to set up instrumentation panels and everything within the station. And then permitting and engineering. Once we wanted to construct something in the pond that triggered several permits that would need to be obtained. So we had to, we had to think about the extensive permitting that would be required. And then in terms of engineering, we would, we would need to do some, uh, some survey in the pond, a bathymetric survey to, to see what the topo was like um, for the grades in the pond. And then also we'd want to conduct uh, some additional borings in the pond to see what sort of materials we were looking at. And then of course we looked at costs. So looking at these two alternatives, it was pretty clear at that point, even though the cost for the new pump station and new intake were a little bit higher, that the way to go was to construct the new intake with the new pump station up closer to the new treatment plant. Um, we did look at a number of alternatives to construct the new intakes. We narrowed it down to two, directional drilling or open cut in the pond. So just, just kind of a side-by-side -side comparison to show the pros and cons. Directional drilling was a trenchless technology. No dewatering would be required versus an open cut excavation where we'd have to trench sheet within the pond. We'd have significant dewatering, um, which would result in significant construction time. Uh, no heavy equipment would be in the pond for the drill. The drill would be set back away from the pond. Um, and less vehicle access to the show would be required versus an open cut where you'd have physical equipment in the pond uh, doing the open cut and you'd have many more vehicles at the shore, um, which was also not ideal for being in the, the town's current surface water supply. Uh, directional drill, much less drilling, I mean much less dredging. Um, open cut would require greater dredging, even though technically when you directional drill, the volume taken up by the pipe is considered dredging, so there's still a little bit of dredging. Um, and as far as impacts to aquatic life and water quality, Concerns were much less with the directional drill versus an open cut. Um, and then construction time, directional drilling. Directional drilling was much shorter construction time. Permitting, uh, once, we, once we were constructing something in the pond, it triggered several, several permits. We had the file of notice intent with the Conservation Commission. 
Long Pond is a great pond, so it triggered the Chapter 91 license with the Mass DEP. And then once we were doing any type of dredging in an outstanding resource water, it triggered the 401 Water Quality Certificate and the Army Corps Permit. And then Natural Heritage, so not directly related to the work in the pond, but the Eastern Box Turtle is an uh, endangered species out there. Um, so we had to provide the necessary silt fence uh, around the construction site in order to prevent turtles from coming onto the construction site after it was swept prior to construction. All right, so here's just a, a, a quick partial plan of the design. A little difficult to see, but um, in green here, this is a, a silk curtain in the pond that would be installed essentially to enclose the entire construction area where the drilling would occur into the pond. We had two intake screens, one out further than the other. Um, in order to have a, a difference in elevation, we wanted one to be at least 10 feet below the other. The one that's closer is at the higher elevation. We were gonna set that one at the elevation of the existing intake because we were certain of the water quality at that elevation, so we wanted to keep that. Um, and then this further one, this one further out was about 10 feet below because we wanted to try to get potentially a different water quality if, uh, if in the future the, the higher in, intake uh, had any issues. Um, these four red dots are additional borings that we did in the pond. I want to mention here that all the borings showed uh, consistent materials to all the borings that we had done during design upland for the treatment plant, just sand and gravel materials, all consistent. And then this shows the two intakes. There's two intakes running, one running to each screen. And then in between, we had a 12-inch carrier pipe with a two, three-inch air burst lines would be fed through uh, in order to connect up to the intakes. During construction planning, uh, we had to confirm that all drilling fluids would be NSF 61 certi certified. Uh, the, the driller actually came up with a value engineering proposal to eliminate the 12 inch carrier pipe and avoid one drill hole. He could connect the two three inch airburst lines to each 24 inch intake and pull those back together, essentially making two drill holes instead of three. And then we did also talked about there being greater flexibility with the elevation of the lower intake. Again, because we wanted to maintain that first screen at the higher intake close to the elevation of the existing intake. <clears throat> Preliminary construction, so just prior to construction, they excavated the pump station down to about 10 feet. Originally, we didn't call for this and we showed the rig further back, but they figured they could excavate and get the rig closer and get a better angle for the directional drill. They fused the two 24 inch intakes and three inch airburst lines, um, about 400 linear feet of each. The <clears throat> diver installed its barge and silk curtain in the pond. I talked about the silk curtain a little before. And then just prior to construction, they had to float these pipes out into the pond in preparation for the pullback. And then the driller trained the diver on the drill head removal and connections. So just a quick directional drilling, you drill out with a small pilot hole. The diver has to then dive down and disconnect the drill head and connect on the reamer all underwater and then pull back the reamer and the pipe um, back. So you're just drilling out with a small pilot and you actually pull the pipe back from within the water itself. So just some quick pictures. This is the 24 inch pipe being fused on land. Just another picture. You can see it started to get pretty long, a pretty massive operation. And then these are the 24 inch intake ponds floated, uh, pipes floated out into the pond in preparation to pull back. You can see the divers in the background on the barge and you can see the top of the silk curtain on each side. And this is a containment area where the rig would be located. Uh, if anything spilled off the rig, we wanted to be able to contain it uh, within some plastic uh, sheets. So day one, uh, I'll just run through construction quickly. Um, we showed up, driller drilled out its first pilot hole on the southern alignment, so the southern edge of the silk curtain. Um, they drilled out at an elevation uh, in preparation for the lower intake screen. When they drilled out, they encountered unexpected pockets of rocks and cobbles, which wasn't a good thing for directional drilling. Uh, all, the, all the borings we did showed just sand and gravel. We didn't see any rocks, didn't see any cobbles, but the reamer that they had on site wasn't the proper reamer for pulling back through rocks and cobbles. Um, they were expecting sand and gravel. So at that point, the driller immediately got on the phone and ordered a unique reamer in order to potentially have to pull back through rocks and cobbles. Um, if they were to use the existing reamer with the rocks and cobbles, it would just be an increased risk for essentially getting the, the pullback stuck. Um, and at that point, you lose everything that you had in the water. So any pipe that you started pulling back through the borehole, you would lose, and all the pilot 
piping that was out that would all get stuck because uh, if you lost the hole and with no exit pit, with being in the pond, there was no way to, to pull back from the exit pit to pull the piping back. So you may have to cut back on shore and lose all the piping that you had, all the drill piping that you had going out into the pond, which wasn't a good thing. So a little bit of head scratching after day one. This is just a, a picture of the uh, directional drill rig. Um, you can see the small pilot, pilot being drilled up here. And then this is the, the front of the, the pilot drill, the drill head there going out. So day two, everybody came in uh, after that first day, uh, not having all the answers. The rock reamer, we were notified by the driller, wasn't expected to arrive for a week later. So instead of uh, accepting delays at that point, the decision was made to pull back the small, a small three inch airburst line uh, by itself because we knew we piloted out, pulling back a three inch line was a lot easier than pulling back uh, a large 24 inch line. So they pulled back the three inch airline. They then did a second pilot up at the higher elevation, more in line with the higher intake screen would go. And they drilled that one out. They hit some better materials going out, still some rocks and cobbles, but much better than the, the first pilot. And they actually pulled back the second three inch airline that, that same day. This is just a picture of the two three inch airburst lines after they pulled them back to the shore. So day three, uh, in order to keep going, this was a Thursday, they drilled the third pilot hole, knowing that the conditions were a little better, better at the higher elevations. So they drilled to the north of the uh, airburst lines and they drilled at the higher elevation. They did hit material consistent with the second pilot, which was decent material. Uh, the driller at that point felt pretty confident that he could ream the hole, so he used a 20 inch reamer and reamed the hole back and the hole held. It didn't collapse and the hole was stable. Um, so on Friday, sorry, this is just a picture. You can see him drilling out for the third uh, pilot hole. On the Friday, they came in and after they reamed back with the 20 inch reamer, they then set up a 32 inch reamer and connected the 24 inch intake line and swivel behind it and they pulled back the 24 inch line successfully. Um, soil conditions encounter were better than those observed during the first and second drill holes. And at this point, they were seeing that the soil conditions were improving as the drills hole, drill holes moved further and further to the north. This is just a picture of the 32 inch reamer uh, that was used to pull back. The, the rig is on the left side and the swivel and the pipe would be on the right side in this picture. Day five, Monday, they came in. Um, at this point, we had to make a decision, do we drill out high and then run the pipe along the pond bottom down to the elevation where we wanted it to be, which wasn't ideal because then you'd have a, a lot of exposed piping in the pond, or do we take the chance knowing that conditions were getting better as you move to the north and shoot down towards the lower elevation. So <laughs> the owner made the decision to, to go for it and to shoot down at the lower elevation. They did encounter some rocks and cobbles, but overall the soil conditions were, were definitely better than the first pilot. And uh, although there was a risk um, to pull back the 24 inch intake in these conditions, uh, the, 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 driller, the driller was confident and showed us that he was confident and, and did a nice job in pulling back that second 24 inch intake. So this is just a picture. You can see the first 24 inch intake line uh, pulled back and they're drilling out for the second intake. And then finally on the last day of construction, they used the 32 inch reamer to pull back that second 24 inch intake line from the deeper elevation. Uh, they attached an excavator on land. They chained it up to the rig to give it some additional support to pull back through those difficult pockets. And that same day, the, the, the driller demobilized. Um, so all, all in all, the driller only took one week to complete all this work, even with the uh, conditions that they encountered. It's just a picture of the excavator and the additional support it provided for the rig on that last pullback. This just shows the final layout. You can see the, the two three-inch airburst lines and then the two intakes further to the north. Elevation-wise, the deeper one was, a, was just a little bit more than 10 feet below, um, which was what we wanted, and the top one lined up well with the minus three elevation, which we were looking for. This is the invert of the pipe, so you had an elbow that went up to the top of the screen. So in wrapping up, lessons learned. Uh, additional geotechnical engineering efforts may have been a good, a good idea instead of the four borings. Maybe we could have done a better grid uh, to try to hit some of these rocks and cobbles. Um, Drilling low risk pilot holes at different elevations provided critical information uh, that was helpful during construction. So in the future, if we're drilling for multiple pipelines, starting with the smaller pipelines would be the better idea because you wouldn't have the risk of having to, to change plans uh, to pull back a smaller line if you were planning for the larger line to go in that location. And then cobbles present more challenges considered to, 
compared to consistent sand or rock because um, you could get the cobbles wedged between the reamer and the pipe and lock up the pipe and essentially lose all that equipment. And then finally, horizontal alignment um, during pilot hole drilling can be adjusted, but vertical realignment is, is difficult. If you were to drill out at a lower elevation and you hit some bad materials, you couldn't pull back and then drill out at the higher elevation because your materials below would be, would be weak and you, could just, you would just lose the hole above it. Finally, acknowledgments. Just want to thank Ray Jack and Steve Rafferty with the Falmouth Water Department and Patrick O'Neill and Phil McClellan with Tate and Howard. Questions for Ryan. 